This program contains real and reenacted violent combat scenes. Viewer discretion is advised. 1,300 U.S. Marines close in on the Iraqi city of Nazaria. Their mission? Seize two bridges for follow-up forces to cross on their way to Baghdad. But lying in wait within the city are 5,000 Saddam Hussein loyalists hidden in homes and on side streets and determined to annihilate the Americans. Here now is the anatomy of an ambush, shot-by-shot -shot accounts of deadly gunfights never before told. As the ferocious shootout for Nazaria erupts, the blood of U.S. troops will darken the pavement of Iraq's ambush alley. March 23, 2003. Highway 7, one mile south of Nazaria, Iraq. 6.30 a.m. Sergeant Matthew Rose of the U.S. Army's 507th Maintenance Company is fighting exhaustion and struggling to keep his eyes focused on the road. His supply truck is fourth in line in an 18-vehicle, 33-man maintenance convoy pushing its way north across the Iraqi desert. Many of the trucks weigh up to five tons, but they offer little protection for the soldiers inside. We're not driving armored vehicles. You know, it's just a, a truck. Um, and I can tell you, a bullet will go right through the door of a five ton. The maintenance company is desperately trying to catch up to its parent unit, the 3rd Infantry Division, after falling well behind because of mechanical problems. Now it's missed a critical turn and is steering directly into Nazaria, a southern Iraqi city nestled on the banks of the Euphrates River. Sergeant Rose doesn't know it yet, but his tiny convoy is headed for a hornet's nest. The unit crosses the Euphrates Bridge and actually makes it the two and a half miles north through the city before realizing its error. At some point in time, the commander decided that our best course of action would be back through Nasiriya. The soldiers turn their trucks around and head back south. They're just one mile from the southern edge of town when gunfire erupts at the head of the column. I realized that there was a guy 25 feet off the road. He was trying to kill me. It was just a kind of an odd realization as you're driving along. Wow, someone's really trying to kill me. Some convoy passengers use their M16s to shoot out the truck windows, but most have never heard a shot fired in anger, and they are stunned by this unexpected attack. I remember that I just started praying, you know, this is, you know, it's not my time. I don't, I don't want to die now. The convoy drivers step on the gas as dozens of Iraqis armed with AK-47 assault rifles and rocket-propelled grenades fire from balconies and doorways at the edges of the road. The convoy started breaking up as vehicles are getting hit and starting to break down. Vehicles that are still mobile make their way back across the Euphrates Bridge and limp south under RPG and machine gun fire. Three miles from town, as more trucks take disabling shots, six soldiers from the convoy help four wounded men to cover several dozen yards from the roadway. The six able-bodied troops form a defensive perimeter around their wounded and, for the next hour, use their M16s to fend off dozens of Iraqi fighters advancing from the city across open fields. Few of the Americans expect to survive the day. 8 a.m. Four miles south of the struggling 507th survivors, the men of 1st Battalion, 2nd Marine Regiment are themselves approaching Nazaria. They're on a mission to prevent a potential attack from the city and to clear a route through the town if necessary. They are completely surprised when they encounter U.S. Army soldiers ahead of them. Somebody said that they have made liaison with some army soldiers that were on the ground. And 
A lot of us monitoring the radio thought that was really weird because we were the forwardmost unit, or at least so we were told, we're the forwardmost spearhead that's going into the city. No one was supposed to be in front of us. Battalion leaders send tanks along with two Amtraks from Alpha Company to see what's going on. An Amtrak is the Marine Corps' light armored troop carrier. What they find doesn't look good. Five burning supply trucks litter the road. The vehicles were shot up, windscreen shot up with holes, uh, doors open, blood pouring from the seats in the cab down to the ground, uh, bullet casings, abandoned weapons, just a, a sight that really catches your attention. Some two and a half miles south of town, the tanks take fire from distant enemy vehicles and engage. Meanwhile, the Amtraks continue their search for the soldiers. One of the Marines in charge is then Gunnery Sergeant Justin LaHue. My driver, PFC Sasser, noticed some guys in the field waving their arms in the air, and they were American troops. Their casualties that were the worst off were in the center of their little circles, and they were somewhat putting up a defense. Gunny LeHue and First Sergeant James Thompson leap from an Amtrak and move toward the soldiers. The troops are in a ravine and still under fire. First Sergeant James Thompson, uh, he starts putting him into the back of the vehicle, and I, at the time, start climbing up onto the side of the vehicle and get up in the weapon station, traverse the weapon station in the direction the firing starting to come from, and then fire the 50 cal into the fields out there. When we did that, they stopped firing real quick. That kind of let them know, hey, there's, there, there's bigger people here to deal with. The soldiers in the ravine breathe a collective sigh of relief. We started loading these guys. I mean, these guys had AK-47 rounds stuck in the shoulders, their arms just had, like, shirts torn off their bodies and tied around them. They were, like, so thankful that we showed up. And, I mean, these guys were like, thank you, you know, I love you. I've had a friend from high school that was a Marine, and I often tease him about being a Marine. At that point in time, I loved the Marines. They were my favorite people. The two Marine Amtraks carry the Army soldiers to safety. But this is not how the operation at Nazaria was supposed to start, with the rescue of a lost convoy. And worse, there are 15 to 20 soldiers still missing. It's unknown if they are dead or in the hands of the Iraqis. Controlling Nazaria is critical. The city occupies a key strategic location, and the two main thrusts of the invasion will have to move by it on their way to Baghdad. One Marine column will come close to the outskirts of the city. To ensure the route is open, a separate Marine task force led by 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines will rush forward and seize two bridges, one over the Euphrates River at the south end of Nazaria, and one over a canal at the city's northern limit. The road between the bridges is lined with buildings, and less optimistic planners have dubbed the thoroughfare Ambush Alley. In my opinion, if they wanted to block that road with a couple of donkey carts and a pile of rocks, they could have done it and kept us there. We plan for that being an easy trap. The Marine plan is to avoid the road by skirting around the east side of the city. Here's the setup. 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines has three infantry companies, Alpha Company, Bravo Company, and Charlie Company, along with a company of tanks. Alpha Company will lead the way, taking the first bridge, which spans the Euphrates River. The Tank Company will support Alpha from a firing position on the southeast side of the bridge. Bravo Company is next. With three tanks out in front, it will charge across the Euphrates Bridge and then immediately jog right and head north along the eastern outskirts of town. Charlie Company is supposed to stay right on the heels of Bravo as they wind around to the east. They are supposed to get up to the north, and, and then the two of them are supposed to hold and allow the tanks to come through from the rear. Tanks are a critical part of the plan. They protect the Amtraks carrying the infantrymen. Amtraks are actually amphibious assault vehicles. They're made to float. The armor is really just two inches of aluminum. 
So while an Amtrak can repel most small arms fire, it is highly vulnerable to RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades. One shot would take us out, you know, we're an aluminum vehicle, so it's kind of like driving a big beer can. But tanks can absorb all types of fire and deliver devastation in return, so they usually send the enemy scrambling. They'll need to be in the lead at all times for this plan to work smoothly. But no one could have foreseen that a misdirected army maintenance convoy would inadvertently spoil the element of surprise and whip the city into a frenzy ahead of time. Now, as survivors of that convoy are being rescued and news gets back to high-level Marine commanders that an unknown number of U.S. soldiers might be prisoners of war, getting 1st Battalion 2nd Marines into Nazaria takes on a new sense of urgency. The bridges need to be secured anyway. Um, so they viewed it as a, an opportunity to save the soldiers while they were still in the area, knowing that they may very well get whisked away and who knows what. So they made a hard decision to, uh, to launch us into the attack quicker than they had intended, and uh, I think for good reason. But the timing couldn't be worse, because Alpha and Charlie companies are now out of their vehicles looking for enemy fighters in roadside buildings, and the tanks have gone to the rear to refuel. They are critically low on gas after an all-night trek. But even with his tanks refueling, under pressure to get his Marines into the city as quickly as possible, Battalion Commander Lieutenant Colonel Rick Grabowski orders his companies to move out. Bravo will now lead the way. Basically, that was game on. We're going in. At this point, the Marine Battalion has lost the element of surprise. It's attacking without its tanks, and unknown to the Marines, thousands of fanatical Fedayeen fighters and Ba'ath Party loyalists have infiltrated Nazaria in recent days. They have taken control of the city, intimidated the residents, stockpiled weapons, and set up fighting positions. The fog of war is rolling in. For the 1,300 men of 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, the struggle for the bridges of Nazaria will be one of the worst street fights in history. March 23rd, 2003, 11 a.m. Nazaria, Iraq, just north of the Euphrates River Bridge. The tanks and Amtraks of Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, some 300 men, are squeezing their way down a narrow side street in route to Nazaria's eastern limit. You could have reached out and touched the buildings, they were so close. All someone has to do is go up on top of, of one of the roofs, take a pop shot with an RPG and disappear. It's very, very, very tough to fight in an environment like that, especially if you are enclosed in a vehicle. The company, along with the battalion commander and his forward command element, is spearheading a mission to seize bridges at both ends of the city. The road between the bridges is a potential ambush alley, so the Marines have opted to skirt the city to the east and attempt to reach the second bridge with less resistance. But when they pour off the end of the Euphrates Bridge at high speed, they miss their turn, the road they planned to take to skirt the eastern edge of town. Even if they could have made that right, it would have been really hard to make. They would have had to make it at slow speed. So as it was, uh, speed was important. So they, they overshot it a little bit. They turned right a little bit later. And uh, that's when I lost sight of them. Now, as the Bravo Company vehicles take this alternate roadway east, Iraqi fighters open up with punishing fire from all directions. rooftops, in, you know, from windows, uh, behind fences, it was a constant. As the embattled Bravo vehicles finally reach the eastern edge of town, they break free of the menacing rows of neighborhood buildings onto what looks like a hard dirt surface. Seconds later, the lead tanks, along with the battalion commander's communications vehicle and a few others, sink to the tops of their tractor treads in a foul soup of loose mud and human excrement. What had appeared to be a solid dirt surface was actually the dried top crust of a deep sewage bog. 
The harder the heavy tanks and Amtraks try to reverse out of the smelly muck, the deeper they sink. And for the infantrymen looking on, the sight of the tanks out of commission is chilling. When you see a tank, um, you know, down, it, it, it does cause you to think, well, what do I do next? Iraqi fighters see the vehicles become stranded and quickly pour on AK-47 and RPG fire. Infantrymen scramble from the mired Amtraks to cover Marines working to get the vehicles unstuck. They rush to the corners of nearby buildings and unleash vicious fire on anything that looks threatening. And it's soon clear that the enemy fighters are not all male or even adult. You would see a woman and a man and a child standing up, waving. And when you blink or if you turn your eyes, the man is, you know, pulling up an AK-47 from behind his back and you have to engage. Lieutenant Colonel Rick Grabowski tries to radio Charlie Company to tell them not to follow, but to push directly to the northern bridge but high voltage power lines overhead are blocking the signals. Back at the Euphrates River, Alpha Company crosses the bridge. Then it carries out its part of the plan by setting up a defensive position north of it, facing west toward the bulk of the city. We're probably there about five minutes, five to eight minutes, uh, when it just seemed like the entire world exploded. Hundreds of armed Iraqis seem to burst from the woodwork and bum rush the Marines. You just see waves of people starting to move towards your position. They have people running from the houses. They have people jumping right out in the road and trying to take a knee with an RPG to shoot the AAVs. Fire was pinging off all of the AAVs. It's coming from the sides of each of the buildings. It's coming from the tops of the buildings. The infantry are now getting into whatever type of covered positions until they can figure out what's going on. You can see them running and massing in the alleys. They were plain clothes, a headdress. The only way you knew that they were bad guys was they all had AK-47s. They are all armed to the teeth. A chief concern for company commander Mike Brooks is that his men not harm innocent civilians. Several seem to be scurrying for cover, surprised by this initial onslaught. Distinguishing combatant from non-combatant isn't always easy. While the firefight is raging, we had a man, his wife, and he's holding an infant in his arms. And they're sitting on a balcony 100 meters in front of us, just observing the fight. And you think, that guy could very well be you know, a forward observer or the commander of this whole thing. He looks sinister, to be honest with you. But I, I wasn't about to clear anybody to engage those people just suspecting that they might have been the commander or something else. It's just, to me, unless it was clear, it just wasn't worth taking the chance. It isn't long before the Iraqis begin attempting suicide charges with automobiles, and they seem to be using the most innocent-looking vehicles they can find. Coming up an alleyway, airs an ambulance and it's got its siren flashing, it's got the red stripe down, you see the C on the side, everything, and it is driving at a high rate of speed right towards my vehicle. We fired a couple of warning shots, the ambulance didn't stop, he was still coming straight at our position, fired straight into the cab. The ambulance ended up stopping. I remember just seeing him just waste that ambulance because they were using it against him. The back end of that ambulance flew open, and five or six guys clad in black with AK-47s jumped out the back end of that ambulance. That was enough to make other younger Marines look and say, rules of engagement, what are we firing at? What are we not firing at? They're using ambulances, and they're using everything else to cover their own movement. As Alpha Company battles to beat back enemy attacks from the west, north, and east, Charlie Company, last in the battalion column, crests the Euphrates Bridge from the south and reaches the fight. It's Charlie Company's job to take the northern bridge, two and a half miles ahead at the other end of Ambush Alley. The Battle of Nazaria is already ugly, and for the men of Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, it's about to become desperate.
March 23, 2003. Euphrates River Bridge, Nazaria, Iraq. 12 p.m. The men of Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, commanded by Captain Dan Whitnam, are crossing the bridge into the Battle of Nazaria. Alpha Company is already in the fight, some 500 yards ahead. The plan of attack calls for Charlie Company to secure a second bridge two and a half miles ahead at the other end of Ambush Alley. They are to follow Bravo Company to get there. The two companies are to cross the Euphrates Bridge, jog right, and sweep north around the eastern edge of town. Right now, we're at a decision point. The company commander, he's, he's looking off to the east, trying to, trying to look for Bravo Company. That's who we're supposed to be following. He can't see him. Captain Whitnam has no idea that Bravo is bogged down in mud and under attack by Iraqi fighters on the eastern side of town. High power lines are interfering with radio signals, so the two companies cannot communicate. He makes a decision, hey, they must have pushed up uh, the, main, the main highway there, and they must be up close to the northern bridge by now. We've got to get there and help them. The captain orders his Amtraks to forget about trying to cut around the eastern side of town and to push straight up Ambush Alley toward the northern bridge. The 11 Amtraks of Charlie Company rev their engines and go for it. Soon after, rounds start pinging off the sides of the vehicles. Once you start taking fire, Marines don't tend to stay down in the hole. And, you know, as I turned around, Staff Sergeant Jordan was laying on the top of the vehicle firing rounds, even though I'm saying, you know, Staff Sergeant, get in the vehicle. It's no good. Then quickly, the shooting surges to a torrent of rifle and machine gun fire. We're starting to come through the city, and we're taking fire from everywhere. People running across the street, from behind us, from on top. We're about 10 feet above the ground, so you see a lot of stuff being on top of a track. Infantryman Corporal Kevin Doughty and his fire team are inside Amtrak number C211. I had one of my machine guns up there, and he just started to let loose. Try to calm him down, conserve his ammo. I said, only shoot at what you know. Well, he kept shooting, so obviously there was quite a big one on. The driver of the first vehicle in front is then Lance Corporal Ed Castleberry. I'm pushing, I'm pushing hard, you know, trying to get, just get through. Everybody in the back's just pooping and hollering and just shooting like crazy, you know, because we have a hatch open and there's 10 infantry guys with machine guns standing out top, pulling people down. There's people running in from alleys, you know, shooting RPGs at us. Gunfire tracer rounds going off. And I'm just thinking, wow, this is really, you know, surreal to me. Pressing his vehicle up the embattled roadway, Lance Corporal Castleberry is stunned to see two suicidal fetying fighters dash into the street directly in front of his vehicle. They were expecting to shoot the RPG at us. They would stop us and then they could just reload and just kill us. Both Fedeyeen RPG shooters let loose their rockets at point-blank range. One RPG shot straight as an arrow and it went below where we were at. And the other one shot off like a corkscrew. Just, you know, into nowhere. Then, Castleberry retaliates against one of the Iraqis with the most lethal weapon at his disposal his Amtrak. He was trying to reload, and I just, I gunned it, and I clipped him. He ran forward, and then I just hit him with 27 tons of, of death. Minutes later, the Charlie Company Amtraks finally arrive at the Northern Bridge. No Marines have been killed, and the Amtraks have escaped serious damage. But before they all make it across, tragedy strikes. The second to last vehicle, Charlie 211, takes an RPG round in the side. 
Corporal Kevin Dowdy is inside the vehicle. I look over to on the other side of the track and I see Corporal Glass. First I see his leg, which is only halfway there, and then I see his face. And it's like, nah, I didn't just see that. Inside the Amtrak, Dowdy rushes to the aid of Corporal Glass and three other wounded Marines as the disabled vehicle limps its way the last few hundred yards across the bridge. The track was burning when it was coming over the you know, bridge. The engine was still intact and everything, so it was still operational, but it was whole side was on fire. As soon as it stopped, you know, Marines just started piling out of it, and that thing burnt to the ground. The other 200-plus infantrymen of Charlie Company take up hasty fighting positions on both sides of the roadway. Then we just started getting bombarded with a, a massive amount of artillery, small arms fire, RPG. I mean, anything you can think of, they were throwing at us because we were just sitting ducks right there. Bravo Company is nowhere in sight, but it's Charlie Company's mission to secure this bridge. They must stay here. Unfortunately, the troubles for Charlie Company have only just begun. These men are about to become victims of the most horrific tragedy of Operation Iraqi Freedom. March 23, 2003, 12.30 p.m. Nazaria, Iraq. The three companies of 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines are shrouded in the murky fog of war, and they're fighting for their lives. Bravo Company is on the east side of town and attempting to fight its way north, but some of its vehicles have become mired in a sewage bog, and high-voltage power lines overhead are causing radio communication problems. Alpha Company has seized and is trying to hold the bridge over the Euphrates River at the south end of town. But it's in a desperate fight and has its hands full. And now, Charlie Company has battled its way up Ambush Alley and crossed a bridge at the north end of town. It's under mortar and artillery fire. The Iraqis have prepared to defend the bridge, so dozens of enemy mortarmen, in hidden positions hundreds of meters away, have the area just north of the bridge, Charlie Company's current position, zeroed in. They're also using RPGs as cheap mortars, launching them high into the air. They're lobbing them in at max range. They know our max effective range for, for an M16 is 550 meters, and they're staying out of that. Then First Lieutenant Ben Reed is the company's weapons platoon commander and fire support team leader. The three 60 millimeter mortars in the company are under his command. My only thought at that point was, hey, I just got to get my mortarman firing. Pick out a target and get those guns up and get them dropping. And I could see the mortarman, they were just boom, boom, boom. They were like almost melting the tubes, you know, dropping so many, getting them off all they could, trying to kill the enemy, you know, because we were getting hit pretty, pretty good at this time. Probably saved a lot of lives. The officer in charge of calling in artillery support is 2nd Lieutenant Fred Pokorny, a 31-year-old prior enlisted Marine from Nevada. Since arriving at the Northern Bridge, he's been having trouble reaching the artillerymen on the radio. Now, he runs over and reports to Reed that he's finally made radio contact with the artillerymen and that he's called in some fire missions. And I said, all right, good to go. And uh, just as I turned back to spot for, for uh, some rounds that my mortarman had just dropped, Something, something big blew up behind us. The ear piercing sounded like something just hitting, slamming down on the concrete. An indirect explosive round of some sort has made a direct hit on the mortar squad's position. Reed is kneeling, and his arm is slammed against the roadside embankment. I said, damn it, I think my arm's broken. And uh, it wasn't broken, but I thought it might be because I couldn't move it. The Marine right behind me, Corporal Gonzalez, he said, that's too bad, sir. And, and you could hear it in his voice. You, you know, he just, he was not in the same shape that he had been, you know, seconds before. You could hear some moaning, and, and uh, it just wasn't a good situation. The blast takes three lives, including those of 2nd Lieutenant Fred Pokorny, 
and reads platoon sergeant, Staff Sergeant Philip Jordan. He had been making several runs under, under some of that fire back and forth, shuttling ammo down to us. I wanted to go get the corpsman, so I turn to the north and I start to run to where my other two mortars are, the, the, the platoon corpsman's there with those mortars. And I don't know how far I got, probably 15, 20 feet. And uh, one second I'm running, the next one, my face is just slammed into the dirt. A second explosive shell blows Reed to the ground. I mean, it was like slow-mo, just the blood started to pool in the dirt uh, right there. And I started to get up and just kind of fell back down. And, and I remember thinking, you know, this is it. You know, how's this work? You know, I just, do I just lay here and die or what, you know? And I can't explain it, but for some reason, I ended up getting up. Reed gets up and continues to try to find help for his wounded Marines. The right side of his face is riddled with shrapnel. Later, Reed has to ask his company gunnery sergeant if his eye is still in place. But the most devastating blow to the young officer and to Charlie Company as a whole on this day has yet to come. Around 1 p.m., a forward air controller with Bravo Company, two miles south of Charlie's position, makes radio contact with two Air Force A-10 fighter bombers over an emergency frequency. The job of a forward air controller is to call in fire missions from aircraft to support infantrymen on the ground. As the A-10s reach Nazaria, they spot the Charlie Company Amtraks north of the Saddam Canal Bridge, but mistake them for enemy vehicles. The pilots report the sighting to the Bravo air controller. The controller and the other commanders in the vicinity have no clue that Marine forces have made it that far north. They think Charlie Company is still south of their position. Based on the information the controller has at hand in the fog of battle, he concludes that the vehicles the A-10s have spotted must be an Iraqi mechanized unit on its way into town to kill Marines. So he clears the A-10s to open fire. We see an A-10 flying around, and uh, we're thinking, OK, great, cool. We've got somebody helping us out. Well, actually, I know it's kind of shooting in the wrong direction. The A-10s unleash slashing barrages of fire from their 30-millimeter Gatling guns. I remember just going, Jesus. Green sparks just impacting from, uh, I'm assuming, from its 30-millimeter. And uh, everybody just took off and scattered. It fires so many rounds at one time, it's not like a machine gun. You can hear the... You know, rat tat tat, it's just whoop, all at one time. It, it, it showers a pretty wide area with depleted uranium rounds, and whatever's in that area is dead. In this tragic case, it's 300 U.S. Marines and their vehicles that are in the kill zone. The A 10 fire kills at least one Marine and wounds several more. There's so many casualties at this point that if we don't get them to medical attention, they will die. Charlie Company Marines load the wounded onto six Amtraks and point the vehicles back south toward Ambush Alley. They're going from one kill zone to another. And the A-10s, who still think the Amtraks are enemy vehicles, are lining up for the final blow. March 23rd, 2003, 1.30 p.m. Ambush Alley. Nazaria, Iraq. Six Amtraks full of wounded men from Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, are rushing south from the Saddam Canal Bridge, headed for an aid station. And through tragic and bizarre circumstances, they are under attack by two U.S. Air Force A-10 fighter bombers. This disastrous occurrence has come about through a classic illustration of the adage, the fog of war. When A-10 fighter bombers arrived over Nazaria to support the Marines, they spotted what they believed to be enemy vehicles and dismounted troops north of the Saddam Canal Bridge. The pilots reported the sighting to the Bravo Company forward air controller. Charlie Company doesn't have an air controller of its own. Radio communications between companies have been sketchy the entire battle 
and the forward air controller with Bravo has no idea that Charlie Company has made it up to the northern bridge. As the Amtraks head south, he thinks the vehicles are Iraqis on the attack, so he clears the A-10s to open fire. Lance Corporal Ed Castleberry is driving one of the vehicles. I'm following a track, and right in front of that thing, just, it goes. I see a white flash. You know, something hits the top of it. I just see the inside of it. You know, half of the Amtrak blew out the side. Everybody in the back, pieces, people, blown. The, the 27 tons of, of steel, of, of aluminum steel, blew three feet in the air. That's a big explosion. Then a second Amtrak is hit catastrophically. Lance Corporal Castleberry's vehicle, just 20 yards away, is luckier. A 30 millimeter round simply penetrates the transmission and Castleberry loses steering. But the young Marine manages to guide the disabled track toward the courtyard of an Iraqi home at the side of the road. The structure will soon earn the nickname, the Alamo. Marines are starting to go inside. They're grabbing you know, the wounded out of the back. You know, they're hobbling them in there. You know, we're, we're providing cover fire for them. The 12 Marines are in the worst crossfire they can imagine, a three-dimensional storm of bullets. You know, some guys in some buildings across the road trying to shoot at us. They, you know, been shooting at us the whole time through at Michelle, but now they had us, you know, as targets. The Marines kick in the door of the house and gently stage the bleeding men in covered positions on the bottom floor. From there, they scramble to the rooftop, cover all corners, and open fire to hold off dozens of Fedeyeen attackers. They're popping around corners. They're trying to, you know, creep their way up the block, you know, trying to get a better shot at us. You know, there's the machine gun pit just constantly, you know, we're sh keep shooting it. It becomes a ferocious three-hour gun battle with several close calls. I actually got grazed inside of the head with a bullet, you know, hit my Kevlar. There was another kid who got his Kevlar shot off of his head. Sitting there shooting, and, a, and an enemy bullet went, <laughs> hit him in the front. His Kevlar just flew off his head. I was like, hey, can you guys pass me that? Real calm. I was like, yeah, buddy. Yeah. For one Marine, the gunfight becomes a living nightmare when he shoots an Iraqi assailant who slumps against a wall in an upright position. He gets shot and he, he dies. He dies with his eyes open staring at, at this guy. And it, you know, it's his little post, it's his area of responsibility, is the corner of the house. And he's freaking out. This guy looks like he's still staring at him. He's been staring at him for like two hours. Because <laughs> he, was, he was having a hard time up there. And he was just like, he just keeps looking at me. Finally, somebody else had to go over there and just shoot that guy down until he just quit looking at him. Every able-bodied Marine is needed in the fight. So the wounded down below are caring for each other the best they can. Some of the wounded, like Trevino, was holding was holding uh, Elliot's neck, and Elliot was holding Trevino's head, and they were laying on his ankle, and, you know, trying to apply pressure to these wounds. You know, so they wouldn't bleed out, you know. We're still trying to figure out how the heck we're going to get them out of here. No one knows where the embattled Marines are located, or if they're dead or alive. They do have a radio, but the batteries are almost gone. Castleberry eventually gets a weak signal through to his platoon commander, Lieutenant Connor Tracy, who's still back at the northern bridge. So I hear static transmission of the radio, and all I really got was the name Castleberry. I could hear him fine because he had, you know, a lot of a lot of signal coming into my radio. So I told Castleberry, click one for yes, key twice for no. I think my first question was, are you south of our bridge? And it was yes. And then, no, are you north of the southern bridge? And doing that, I, I kind of pieced together that he was in the city. By this time, the tanks have returned from refueling and have already helped Alpha Company drive off its attackers. When the tanks came in with their main gun round, they were, they were able to take out some of the, the fortified buildings. 
You could hear the cheer erupt from the Marines. Tank Commander Major Bill Peoples gets word of the Marines trapped in the Alamo. He and his XO took off right down Ambush Alley. Just two tanks, unsupported, uh, right up that three mile stretch into God knows what. Peoples drives his tank to the house, turns his turret to the side to make room on top, and is able to transport all of the Alamo's wounded to safety. Later, Castleberry and the other able-bodied Marines catch a ride back to the Northern Bridge in a caravan of Humvees. It's a wall lit out of the city, a wall of lead. Like, there is just, we're shooting every bit of ammo we have left, just so, you know, we can make it out of the town. We only had, you know, a few miles to go. The worst of the day's fight is over. The tanks, along with helicopter gunships, soon drive off most of the remaining attackers for the time being. The Iraqis have suffered hundreds of casualties. Tank retrievers finally reach Bravo Company on the east side of town and pull them out of the muck. And many Alpha Company Marines move up Ambush Alley to help pick up the pieces of Charlie Company. When we got over the top of the northern bridge, I can only imagine that's what the Kasserine Pass looked like in 1942 when it, the Germans hit the Americans because there were burning vehicles. North of the bridge, we saw a track right in the middle of the road completely split open. And that was, that was the third track that I saw that was burning or, or destroyed. I see gear all over the place. I see flak jackets burnt or ripped to shreds. People were like zombies wandering around. Uh, we had one Marine that was running up to us that just kept screaming over and over again, did you see what happened to us? Did you see what happened to us? A total of 18 Charlie Company Marines are dead and 24 are wounded. You feel, you feel pain and, and uh, anger at the same time. Senior leaders do their best to comfort the grieving young men around them. My gunny, and uh, he came up and gave me, you know, just just grabbed me, you know, and embraced me, and, and that's when I, you know, I realized, you know, I felt safe, and I was, it was, a, it was a real emotional moment for me. First Battalion, Second Marines has suffered, but its men have accomplished their mission of seizing the bridges at both ends of Ambush Alley. By the end of the day, when the sun went down, we had secured our two bridges in our mission. So regardless of how much that success they had from 8 in the morning until 13, 1400, 1500 in the afternoon, um, by the end of the day, the Marine Corps, its battalions, its fighting units had accomplished their mission, opened up the road we were supposed to open up, and were pushing forces north. Even so, for the men who fought and watched their friends die in the Battle of Nazaria, it will take years to fully come to terms with it. Nobody set out to get anybody hurt. You know, everybody was doing what they thought was the right thing to do. Uh, and there were problems, there was a lot of friction. But the thing that I hope that history remembers is it wasn't it wasn't the battalion commander or a company commander or the general, you know, that, that ultimately made us successful. It was, it was uh, you know, that Lance Corporal machine gunner or that PFC grenadier or that fire team leader, that sergeant, making calls on the spot, looking out for the welfare of his Marines that ultimately carried the day. The guy that got no glory for it, he got no combat award, he got, uh, he got nothing. Uh, except the, you know, the, the bad memories to live with. Give him that recognition that he deserves.